rocket can look near enough to touch. Yet for centuries, a trip to the moon was just a crazy dream. crazy dream began to come true. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Three, two, one, zero. All engines run. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. July 20th, 1969, the end of a 240,000-mile journey to a completely alien world. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this An historic the telephone the call story. from the Earth to the Moon. Honor for us to be able to participate here today. President Nixon's phone conversation with the Apollo 11 astronauts was a dramatic symbol of Bell system involvement in the communications network needed for the Apollo program. But the Bell system contribution to the first moon landing was far greater than most Americans knew. In headquarters, only a few blocks from the White House, a small company had been quietly at work for nearly a decade, making a unique contribution to the success of the entire space program. The little-known AT&T Western Electric Company was Bellcom, one of the smallest Bell System subsidiaries, formed at the request of NASA in March of 1962. Starting with a tiny nucleus of 30, many drawn from the Bell Telephone Laboratories, Bellcom grew to an organization of 500 men and women from many areas of industry and academic life. They came drawn by the challenge of young John Kennedy's national commitment. They came to help make the crazy dream of a trip to the moon a scientific reality. Yeah. Among the first to arrive was Bob Wagner, executive director of Bellcom's systems engineering division. Well, I was an engineer working in Bell Telephone Laboratories, and one day my boss called me in and said, Bellcom wants to talk to you. At that point in time, we knew what Bellcom was. It was a small company and formed to help the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And uh, it was kind of exciting to be asked to go to it. I had thought of it. When they asked me, I was ready to go. And this was at the time that the Apollo program had just started. The Gemini and Mercury programs had already been conceived. And it was just the exploding space business. It was a big problem. They needed lots of help. And they looked to the Bell System as a large organization. It had a reputation in systems work, systems analysis, systems study, systems engineering. They wanted to tap that understanding and that know-how. Many of the uh, things that we were given credit for by NASA really had to do with, with asking the difficult question. And to NASA, of course, that was important. If we were looking over the program and saying, what if the vehicle doesn't get off the ground on a given day, what will happen? What if Congress decides that uh, we don't want to go to that landing site or the reason why we can't do it now? There's an international situation because, after all, Apollo was conducted in a fishbowl atmosphere. Uh, what if? Working for NASA headquarters, Bellcom people were given tasks involving many aspects of the manned spaceflight program. Their unique job was to evaluate, analyze, and help bring together the diverse details of an unprecedented scientific undertaking. To see the forest and the trees. To supply questions as well as answers before the Saturn V rocket lifted from its launch pad. But what if the 3,000-ton space vehicle is too heavy to get off the ground? 
A question so simple that it seems silly, yet a real problem to NASA throughout Apollo planning. Maybe we can use it later when we talk about uh, site selection or something like that. Carl Martisek worked on microelectronics oh, at right. Bell Labs. Really but his job at Bellcom involved him in fields far from his earlier training. So one of the first problems that uh, we faced in, uh, here at Bellcom and in the Apollo program at large was the problem of trying to decide what requirements did we uh, have to specify for each of these various components of the system. And immediately we came upon the classic confrontation of the, uh, the launch vehicle or the rocket builder versus the spacecraft builder. The spacecraft builder sees more and more requirements on his spacecraft. It has to be able to accommodate the astronauts comfortably, all of their gear. We have to have uh, life support systems. Uh, we have to be able to uh, ensure that they can communicate with the Earth, that they can navigate. All of these things uh, added to the weight and complexity of the spacecraft. So we had to uh, sort of thrust ourselves into the middle of this uh, uh, situation and try to negotiate a, uh, help negotiate a, uh, a reasonable uh, agreement between how much the spacecraft was going to grow and how much uh, weight the, the launch vehicle was going to have to be able to, uh, to lift. All of this, however, depends very strongly on exactly what trajectory we choose to go from the Earth to the Moon. The uh, trajectory is important because it, uh, it determines how much uh, thrust or how much uh, energy, rather, the uh, launch vehicle has to impart to the spacecraft in starting it off on the way to the Moon, and in turn, it determines how much energy the spacecraft has to uh, expend in order to get itself into the lunar orbit, to land on the moon, to lift off from the moon, and finally to return from the moon to the Earth. Three, two, one. A proper balance between the lifting power of the Saturn engines and the weight of the Apollo spacecraft and an effective trajectory are essential to a successful launch and moon landing. But there's another question. What if the enormous power of the Saturn engines literally ripped the rocket apart? Bell comes Bob Sperry. You watch a spacecraft uh, launch from, from the pad. It looks like it's a nice, sleek, aerodynamic vehicle smoothly going through the atmosphere. But inside, of course, there's all sorts of things churning around. Those engines are roaring along. Uh, it's awesome to hear all of the vibration. These longitudinal vibrations uh, of the vehicle being stimulated by the engine are generally called pogo because it is a longitudinal, it's sort of like riding a pogo stick. There is a technique that uh, was developed at Bell Laboratories uh, called voice print. A voice print is a picture showing the relationship of the tone of a person's voice as the time progresses. The voice prints were useful in uh, analyzing the problems with the space vehicle because we could, could look at the voice print of a Saturn V, say, at an engine, uh, at an a inner stage between, say, the S1C stage and the S2 stage, the S2 stage and the S4B stage, the various stages, and the way the patterns change from one part of the space vehicle to the next part, we were able then to determine the kinds of accordion action that we had in the vehicle and therefore understand the actual mechanisms that were involved so that we would not cause the vehicle to destruct itself or maybe impair the operation of the astronaut. Pogo vibrations in check, the mission to the moon moves safely ahead. Streaking through the atmosphere at more than 5,000 miles per hour, the Saturn V jettisons the fuel tanks and engines of its first stage. communications network, much of it the contributions of Bell System Companies, Long Lines, and Western Electric, links the Apollo astronauts to the Earth, an electronic umbilical reaching through the vacuum of space to three men in their spacecraft on the way to the moon. Safe in their spacecraft, the astronauts work, wait, and enjoy the pleasures of weightlessness. Meanwhile, trajectories Bellcom helped design guide them into a precise lunar orbit, ready for descent. The mission has reached another critical phase, and again, Bellcom was there to help. Bob Troster. 
It had been a dream of mine for uh, since I was very young to work in the space program and uh, uh, space exploration had always been a, an exciting thing for me. I came to Belcom about 1966, uh, not from the Bell system, but uh, from outside. I came from uh, Peace Corps when they found out that I worked my way through graduate school by uh, working in the computer department. They said, come to my arms, my beamish boy. And the commander, when, he, when he's landing the limb, has uh, some of the same problem that Bush pilot has, trying to land a plane in rough terrain, except that his problem is even harder because a Bush pilot coming in has a long time to survey the terrain that he's going to land on, pick out a good spot. He knows where he is. There's never any discontinuity in his his vision. The basic problem with landing on the moon is that the lunar surface reflects light in an entirely different way than just about any surface we're familiar with on the Earth. About the only two surfaces that reflect light in any way similar to the Earth to the uh, moon are uh, what's called reindeer moss, curiously enough, and green cheese. Uh, but we don't expect that we'll ever find either of those on the moon. Now, the way it reflects light is is very odd. Normally on the Earth, when you look at something, either you see it reflecting light like a mirror, or it reflects light very diffusely. But when you look at a surface on the moon, and the sun happens to be directly behind you, everything is washed out in a, in a sea of light. So the problem is then picking the proper time in the lunar month, in the lunar day, when the sun is at a point where this washout point is far away from where he wants to land. 300 feet coming down at five. Studies concluded that ideal visibility for descent was when the sun is behind the limb about six to 13 degrees above the landing site. Essential information for a safe landing. 240 coming down at five. Hey, you're really maneuvering around. 96 feet coming down at six. Slow down the descent rate. 80 feet, 80 feet coming down at four. You're looking good. 70 feet. Looking real good. 63 feet. 60 feet coming down at 3. 50 feet coming down. Watch for the dust. Up. 46. Low level. 42 feet coming down at 3. Coming down at 2. Okay. Start the clock. 42 feet coming down at 2. 40 coming down at 2. Looking good. Watch the dust. 81. 32. 30 feet. Coming down at 2 feet. You got plenty of gas. Plenty of gas, dude. Hang in there. 30 seconds. 18 feet coming down at 2. He's got it made. Come on in there. 24 feet. Contact light. Roger. Copy contact. I'll tell you, I, I think we're in a place that's a lot dustier than Neil. The good thing we had a simulator because that was an IFR landing. Holy crap, it's beautiful out here. It sure is. It's something else. Rugged, airless, with only one six Earth gravity, no explorer ever scanned a more alien landscape. What if the Apollo astronauts can't locate the landmarks needed to find their way around? This portrait of the lunar surface created by a computer was a major Bellcom contribution to the solution of this problem. Dick Bass, a group leader on the project, once worked in the automotive industry, a long way from mapping the face of the moon. Working with Dick was Sue Wynn, one of a number of mathematicians at Belcom. Before I came here, I was going to school in Pennsylvania, and Bell Lab interviewed, and they referred me to Belcom. I wanted to get into programming, but I had never worked with a computer before, so it was something completely new and different. And here, they just assumed I could do it, and didn't scare me out of it. One of the biggest tasks we have before each mission is to familiarize the crew with the environment he's going to work in when he's on the lunar surface. In the early missions, this environment was very near the limb and mostly considered knowing what tools he had to work with, what experiments to set out. And he was never afraid of, uh, of worrying too much about the surrounding terrain. But now that the astronauts are more mobile, they need to know as best as we can tell him what the train's going to look like when he gets there. We're trying to provide this information with these computer-generated scenes. They've made topographical maps, and the computer scans this data from a given observer position and determines what portions of the train are visible. We've been able to generate 
full panoramas of what they will see standing on this surface from different Apollo 16 stations. As we watched the TV during the mission from the rover, we could see that as they panned the surface, we could see that it did look like what we told them. It really brings it to home when you can actually see what you've done on the TV screen. There's not much else you can do that you can see results like that. Aboard their moon car, the astronauts explore the ancient secrets of the lunar surface. But this mission has brought them to only a tiny region of the more than seven and a half million square miles on the front side of the moon. The choice of the landing site is not only essential to a safe landing, it is equally important to the scientific success of the mission. Bellcom's help in the choice of lunar landing sites throughout the Apollo program was one of its most valuable contributions. Yeah. Well, that's right, you can't cross that ridge. You yeah. can't go. If you land on the east side, you're stuck there. If you land on the west side, you're stuck. Noel Henners is chairman of the NASA Site Evaluation wow. Committee. You look around Bellcom, you say, what's unique about it? And I think the, the, one of the biggest things is it's just been fun for everybody. When I was a kid, there was very little thought about space. Uh, my big preoccupation was growing chickens. I fully intended to start out in college in agriculture, which I did, become a chicken farmer. The bottom fell out of the chicken market in New Jersey. Somewhere in my sophomore year, I got very interested in geology. I combined agriculture, soil chemistry with geology. From there, I got interested in chemistry, then combined chemistry and geology, became what's known as a geochemist which is hiding the sins of both and gaining the attributes of both. Bellcom's main contribution, in my mind, is the integration of the engineering and the scientific. We have the scientific desires on the one side, we have the hard facts of engineering life on the other side. The whole game of site selection has been iterative. The scientists started off with a large pot of sites they'd like to get to. The engineers had some hardware from spacecraft that had engineering constraints on them. You had just so much fuel. You had to follow certain types of trajectories. You had a certain kind of landing radar system that would only handle certain kinds of topography. So they delineated their constraints. Then as it, the program developed, we said, but we can't continue to go to that kind of site because geology by nature is anti-engineering. The interesting geologic areas are always rough areas where you get mountains coming up and exposing large areas of fresh rock. So they realized that and then went back and said, well, what can we change in the engineering system to allow us to get to these places the scientists want to get to? For geologists, it's unbelievable that in six missions going through Apollo 17, you can find out almost as much about another planet as it's taken us hundreds of years to find out about the Earth. The mission to the moon complete, the Apollo astronauts lift off from the lunar surface. Ahead, rendezvous with the orbiting command module and the beginning of the homeward journey. Few human endeavors have been carried out as faultlessly as the Apollo program. It was a costly adventure, but for many it was money well spent. And from its earliest days, Bellcom's active involvement in all aspects of Apollo contributed to the program's monumental success. Record flash at uh, ground elapsed time of 244 flash hours. Down. The end of an epic Apollo flash journey. Down. Soon another trip to the moon will begin, Apollo 16. But then, after one more mission, the Apollo moon program will end. Nearly three years have passed since the triumphant return of the Apollo 11 astronauts. Soon, American science will turn its attention to other priorities. Not only the exploration of the planets, but pursuits closer to home on Earth. For more than 10 years, Bellcom shared quietly in NASA's great undertaking. But what of the future? Bob Wagner. Several years ago, it became fairly clear that the end of our job for NASA was in sight. And people in Bellcom began to think about the future. What were we going to do? So after a period of about 10 years, in a few days it'll be, in April of 1972, Bellcom will cease to exist as a separate organization and merge with the Bell Telephone Laboratories. We're rather pleased that we were asked by NASA to do the job for uh, manned space flight. Uh, many of our people have a great feeling of accomplishment. That's what's been done over the past 10 years. And really pleased that having seen the job finished, 
we bring our activity to an end and have a good, resounding finish. Now, with uh, our attention being drawn to the Bell Systems problems, we see challenges, many of them different, but practically as large or even larger than many of the ones we face in Apollo. And some of the special feeling that we have for the talents in Bellcom and the people in Bellcom, I think will be well used on these new and large Bell System problems. The people of Bellcom and Bellcom's way of thinking live on, asking those simple questions that often produce the greatest impact on the future. Questions that begin, what if?